Hey guys, and welcome to episode 173 of the OCDStories.com podcast. Now today's episode is sponsored by Riley's Wish. Riley's Wish is a foundation started by mental health and substance use disorder advocate Margaret Sisson. Margaret started the foundation after losing her son Riley to an accidental overdose in 2014. The foundation's goal is to educate, spread awareness and provide resources for individuals and families who are struggling with OCD, substance use disorder or a dual diagnosis. By offering the Riley's Wish lectureship series and sponsoring events with this same purpose, Riley's Wish is determined to address and change the stigma around dual diagnosis. If you would like to learn more about Riley's story, find resources or make a donation, please visit rileyswish.com. That's rileyswish.com. Now in today's episode, I got back on Rose Cartwright. Rose has uh, came on the podcast about eight months ago to talk about her book, Pure. Um, she's quite an outspoken, in a good way, uh, advocate about mental health and specifically um, OCD and Pure OCD, so pure O is the term. Um, her book, Pure, is kind of all about that, and we go over that in the first episode, so I encourage you to check that out. Um, but in this episode, uh, I get her on because her book has now been converted to a TV show, uh, and I wanted to just find out what that's been like, you know, how it's been received, um, and how she's kind of coped with the, I guess, the pressure of that. Um, so yeah, we talk about the TV show. We also talk about what country it might come out in next, because currently it's only in the United Kingdom. Um, how Rose kept control of her story, you know, when it was being produced into a television show, how she kind of uh, stopped it from being sensationalized. So maybe there's some learnings there if you're considering sharing your story. Um, we talk about that. Uh, we talked about dealing with the press, uh, dealing with shame. Talked about self care. Talked about meditation. Um, and what Rose has learned from her own recovery journey. We talked about her uh, initiative Made of Millions, which she co-founded with Aaron Harvey, who's also been on the show before, and then sort of ended on some words of hope. So um, I really hope you enjoy this episode. I always enjoy chatting with Rose. Uh, So without further ado, here she is. On the podcast today, I have Rose Cartwright. Rose is a writer and author of the book Pure, which is now a Channel 4 comedy drama series. Rose is also a director over at IntrusiveThoughts.org and MadeOfMillions.com. Welcome back to the show, Rose. Thanks, G. It's nice to be back. Thank you for having me. It's good to have you here. And your last episode did really well. The listeners seem to really enjoy it. So hopefully they'll love this one too. Yay. When was that? When did we do the last um, one? About a year ago. Not I think it year. might have been. I think it, no, it w- yeah, it would have been summer or autumn. I think it was summer, actually, yeah. yeah. I think it was, yeah, pottering about outside. Yeah, I lose track. Sorry, that's just my, ble- my Bluetooth <laughs> boom is just turning itself off. All good. So, <laughs> you've been busy. Um, I've been busy. Yeah, yeah. And for those of you that haven't heard Rose's show or seen it, and obviously at the minute it's just in the UK, um, but it'd be good to just tell people kind of what it's about. Yep. So Pure is a six-part drama series on Channel 4, and it's based on my book of the same name, um, which is a book that I wrote about um, growing up with uh, OCD, and what we nicknamed Pure O, a variety of OCD, whereby I had intrusive thoughts. Um, mine were always consistently uh, of a sort of sexual, violent nature. Um, And I hadn't heard that spoken about very much Mm. or written about. So I I told my story and, um, yeah, it so quickly escalated from an article into a book and then into a TV show, um, which came out in January, which has all been a bit mad. (laughs) Yeah. I I saw it. I thought it was great. Is there going to no no worries? Is there going to be a second series? Uh, TBC. I want. I'm. I'm asking Channel Four the same question. Maybe <laughs> everyone just needs to put pressure on Channel Four and tell them that they desperately want to see a second series. <laughs> okay, cool. I'll send them um, this episode. Yeah. Um. I hope so. I hope so. I think. Um. I think the story's got legs. Yeah. Um. And I know that a lot of viewers really want to find out what happens to Marnie and how that story is going to progress. So yeah, we'll see. Watch this space. 
Yeah, well, hopefully, and and as I said to people, I think it's one of the best examples of OCD I've seen in the media, um, in TV or film ever. So that's a really good good job on your part and everyone involved. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it was. Um, it's it's so hard. It it was such a, a hard project to get right. You know, it mm. was because this kind of OCD is so subtle in many ways, and it happens in the mind. Yeah. Um, how do you visualize that on screen in a way that's going to hook viewers? Like it was a, it was a real dramatic and creative challenge as well as um, a challenge in terms of getting the mental health stuff right, you know, a great responsibility. Um, and it was just like spinning plates for like two years. <laughs> and like when it came out, uh, I, it was really weird. Like the, the, the sort of, yeah, I was. I just couldn't believe that it was. It still didn't really feel real, you know. Mm. Um, it still doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe in a couple of years. Um, maybe, yeah. After the dust has settled. True. How, how has it all been kind of received by, I guess, people with OCD and just the general population? Um, I, I mean, the 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 critical reviews have been fantastic. We were really happy with it, just cool. as on a sort of a base level as like a, a TV show. Um, you know, the, the creative team was so talented and I think everyone did a really beautiful job and like just making it a really great piece of work. Um, the OCD community was super supportive as well. Um, everyone that reached out to me, just, I suppose, echoing what you just said, that they hadn't really seen this kind of OCD dramatized before and that it meant a lot to, to see it out there and that it had made them feel a lot less weird. And that was lovely. That was, yeah. you know, I didn't take that reaction for granted. I didn't know how people were going to react. Um, so the fact that it seemed to touch people in a meaningful way, um, yeah, I was delighted. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, that's great to hear that you got that feedback. Um, so I got a couple of listener questions. And the first one is, can you ask Rose how she ensured that they, being the production company, represented the condition properly? Um, I'm guessing that it must have been a fine line for her to walk and it could be helpful for others thinking of sharing their story. Uh, yeah, so it, it was a fine line. I think that's a good way of putting it. Um, it was a real challenge. It was quite an unusual adaptation process. Often, um, I mean, it varies from project to project, but often an author of a a book like mine would sort of step away um, and um, let the adaptation process um, sort of take on a life of its own. And it was important that I did that to some extent to, you know, empower the directors and screenwriter and the whole team. But I couldn't step away completely because it's such a subjective story and OCD is really defined by the nuance, I think. And it, that story in particular where I was talking about having intrusive doubts about my sexuality, mm. that could so easily get misconstrued and misrepresented. So I really had to be on hand at every stage from, you know, the first draft of the first script. And um, it sort of took a lot out of me, really. You know, it, 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 it's fantastic. I learned so much. I learned how to make a TV show. It was a really unique privilege professionally. Um, but it's also a challenge to constantly assert yourself and be like, yeah. that's not quite how it is, or this was my experience, or being able to say, look, I don't have any other reason for what I'm about to say other than that I feel this to be true and it's my authentic experience. Um, so, yeah. It, it, it was a balancing act all the time and um, credit where credit's due, the production company, Drama Republic, were committed from the start to getting that right. And that was really important to me when I was meeting different production companies. I wanted to see evidence that they cared about getting the mental health stuff right. Yeah. And they did. So I was lucky that I was allowed to stay close to the story and that I was kept at the heart of the process. Um, and that that Channel 4 wanted to, t to tell a positive OCD story as well, you know. We have the broadcaster to thank for that. Um, so, yeah, it was tricky, 
but I'm really happy with where we ended up and yeah, how we got there. Yeah, good. Well, oh, and, uh, oh, yeah. sorry, and also to add that um, one thing that I said, my sort of line in the sand from the start was that um, we had to have professional consultants on board as well because you know my OCD knowledge is fairly extensive by now I'm sort of expert by experience but I'm not I've had no formal training nor do I ever want to be responsible for giving anybody any kind of professional advice I can't do that and I didn't want the weight of responsibility on my shoulders it was really important to me that we had the seal of approval from from world experts so we ended up with um, uh, Dr. David Veal, who many of your listeners will know, who's like a you know UK expert, and um, Dr. Charles Mansueto, who's um, a, a in leading States. figure in the in the US. Yeah, so um, we were kind of really buttoned up um, in terms of like feeling like we had the right people on side to make sure we told the story right. I wouldn't have wanted to go out there with a product like that without that seal of approval. Yeah, absolutely. It's good to hear you took those steps. I don't think the show would have been as good if it wasn't that authentic. So, no. Yeah. And I, and I think um, the show would never have got made if this wasn't based on a real story, you know, because, um, you know, especially anyone who's seen the show, that opening scene where it's just like a pano yeah. of like her having intrusive sexual thoughts at her... Um, parents wedding anniversary like it's shocking you know um and it it makes sense as you continue to watch the series because you realize it's in the context of her OCD but if that context was stripped away it just wouldn't make any sense so it's it's really important that Channel 4 and the production company had something to point to and go no this is actually real this is something that people experience yeah no very good point um and similar question then from me is I know you you've done a lot of PR and press around Mm -hmm. around the show um, at some of those experiences from when I saw you at your event, uh, you said were quite good and others, some of the journalists kind of took it out of context and didn't do mm-hmm. right by your story. Mm-hmm. Is, there, is there any parting wisdom you could give on those that do work with print media and the press and how they can control their story? Um, yeah, good, good and bad experiences. I think um, for the most part, um, I felt heard and seen and listened to. Mm. Um, I think part of the problem was that um, I was just getting interviewed so often, so frequently. It's sort of when you find yourself, and it's actually nice to be, you know, you're not press, you're a friend, but to be taught to be having an interview in a slightly different format with somebody that I know, you know, Mm. instead of like a journalist that you've been hooked up with through a PR and you have an hour sit down with, like it's very different. Um, to have a back and forth a conversation with someone who understands is, is is really nice, but yeah, I was I was just doing these interviews so often, like you know, at, at one point in January, like you know, three a day from like you know a phone call to um, a sit down, uh, and it, like pre records as well, like doing TV, like it's really stressful, <laughs> and it, and it's wicked to be able to like have the opportunity to tell my story in so many different media, but. Um, there's nothing more isolating when you say something to a journalist that you think is going to resonate and you just see the total lack of co- comprehension on their face. Mm. You know, it's, uh, it, there were moments that felt quite lonely there because, you know, anyone who's never experienced this can empathize to an extent, but you know, they just don't really have any clue. Yeah. And that, that was draining um but it was it was also rewarding because i got to see i i got to see my story in print and saw it done well by a lot of journalists i respect so that was wicked but in terms of advice to journalists i would just say you know you can't i don't think you can really reduce ocd to a set of symptoms um that can be rolled out to any person like it always sits within the context of an individual story, an individual life. Um, And for any kind of mental health coverage, I think it's important to bear that in mind because um, people can come to you and your story with a a default set of assumptions based on a Wikipedia article they've read or a definition on NHS online. Mm. And that 
doesn't nec- that's not necessarily going to be true. So I think just listen, listen to the nuance and, and accept what you're told by people who know what they're talking about. Yeah, no, good point. And for those that want to share their story, did, did you do anything like research the, the journalists and check their previous work or anything like that? Yeah, and um, I wasn't alone in that. You know, I I was very supported by Channel Four. Like they had a duty of care towards me to make sure that I wasn't just thrown into the lion's den. So there were interview requests that we turned down outright. Mm. Um, so yeah, you always vet. You always vet. You always question the motives of the publication. There were some, you know, you, there were some publications you turn down and they'll print anyway. And um, they, you know, their motives are quite clear, yeah. you know, especially because of the sexual content that, that it was used for titillation rather than education. And that was um, just completely predictable. <laughs> um, but, but also quite exposing. And, and, yeah. you know, I, I'm thinking particularly of an article that ran in the sun, like really, really unpleasant. That was a, I was, it was a, that was a really bad morning for me. I, mm. I, you know, nothing, uh, for for anybody that doesn't know, when I first started experiencing intrusive thoughts, I was having um, intrusive thoughts about child abuse, which I'd written about, and um, the son had completely mischaracterized those experiences and um, basically implied that I was a paedophile in a headline. <sighs> and nothing can really... There goes my you, my, my boom again. Um, nothing can really uh, comp- uh, prepare you for that, you know? No. When you see that in print, um it was it was actually quite traumatic like i was shaken up by that Hmm. um that was the worst that was the worst piece of coverage that came out um but but broadly things were things were very respectful and i think journalists took took great lengths to to try and convey the complexity but you know there's always going to be clickbait yeah well sorry they did that and um I'm glad. The overall, it was positive, and of course, it was the Guardian that you had your first uh, article in all those years ago, and that yeah. kind of kicked everything off. So, yeah, it's good to kind of see it almost come full circle. Yeah, it's really not. Yes, yeah, to yeah, to be able that was that was a really good. That was a, yeah, full circle is the word. That was a good moment for me to be able to sort of go back to the same paper after all that time. And be like, yeah, here's what I've been, here's what I've been doing since. That was great, and I always respect the Guardian for printing that story in the first place. Yeah, because you know it was it's a long, it's nearly six years ago now, and actually, you know, it wasn't getting written about or spoken about in in mass media at all. So it was a bit of a step that they took, and I'm always grateful to them for doing that. Yeah, absolutely. So you you ran an event. When was it? A couple of months ago. Uh, yeah 19th of feb that event oh cool um and it was a really good event i enjoyed it but there was something you said that it really stood out for me so i'm going to paraphrase if i've got it wrong i'm sorry but um (laughs) you said the things i was once most ashamed of i'm now most proud of Mm -hmm. um i just wondered if you could explain that a bit yeah i think um i you know, this story that I've told in public about being a kid and having thoughts that, you know, I thought I was the only person in the world that was capable of of a mind like mine. I thought, um, I thought I'd sinned just through thinking and I would have done anything to hide that secret from everybody in the world. I thought I would take it to my grave. Um, and to be able to take something that was once such, such a source of self-stigma for me and to put it into the public and risk the judgment um, and risk being ostracized and risk all those things happening that I was always scared would happen, that people would leave me. Um, that people would think I was a paedophile, that people would think I was suppressing my sexuality, that people would think X, Y, Z. To actually take that risk and do it anyway was quite empowering. Um, and I, I just, I somehow turned it around 
and I suppose that's what I was trying to capture when I said that was that 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 you know even when you're sort of in the bleakest moments where you think that there's no way out like things can go 360 and you could get to a point not for me of being better but for being at peace with something that was once such a source of shame um and it's still you know even as I like all of that's true but I I have to remind myself of it and I'm reminding myself of it now like I don't I don't do that very often and it's good it's therapeutic that's why these kind of conversations are important because I'm like oh yeah like I came really really far um so yeah yeah absolutely and I loved it I I think it just it's not saying at all that you're glad you had OCD but it's saying that (laughs) you're yeah the, the things you would hide now you're showing to the world and you know because you're showing it to the world it's helping so many people and that is something yeah. to be proud of yeah and I think also there's something in there that in 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 coming so far and, and turning things around as I have done I I'm not sure that the all the good stuff could have happened if it if it wasn't for my OCD, like I, my, my OCD took me to some very, very dark places. Mm. Um, and I don't know if I'm at the point of saying that I'm glad it happened, but I also, I'm at the point where I can't imagine it not having happened. And so much good stuff has come out of it. Mm. I'm not sure that, you know, I'm not sure that, you know, maybe it's the same bit of my heart that, that made me a writer that that made me have OCD you know I don't know that's with that no, I get it's just myth making isn't it but like um I guess that just shows the sort of the shift the the kind of the, the sort of the kind of the acceptance that I never yeah. thought I'd reach yeah I agree I, I can absolutely relate to that it's kind of taking years in therapy but I'm at a point where I can be like I, I love who I am and I don't say it in an arrogant way but generally Mm. like who I am and uh yeah if I change one thing in my past I could be somewhere and be something completely different and I would that would be a shame yeah do do you think you'd be the same person if it wasn't for OCD absolutely not yeah Yeah. other things as well that kind of forced me to uh become who I am but OCD was one of them um and absolutely that struggle helped me create a particular character helped me get um show empathy and stuff like this all that I I saw those things develop over time it wasn't something that just came naturally to me and it was developed because I almost had to develop it you know Mm -hmm. yeah is that similar for you yeah definitely definitely I mean like I suppose from an outsider's perspective like you have this amazing podcast as well right Mm. because because of OCD. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, so it's not to say it's not you know it's not to say that um, I think it's easy to sort of sit at a vantage point and 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 c- count your blessings and recognise the good things that have come of it. So it's not to say that yeah, that OCD is a good thing, but like it's very empowering when you can make something good out of it. And I think your podcast shows that. Yeah. No. Thank you. And and likewise. Um, yeah, you're right. There's absolutely this podcast. I can guarantee this podcast wouldn't exist. <laughs> <with us. laughs> yeah, maybe it'd be something else. Um, <laughs> cool. So your your mental health, I can imagine trying to stay on top of it through all of this. Like, obviously, you've got the real extremes of what the sun did, but then you've mm-hmm. got just the amount of the, the your your work schedule over this period must have been really hectic. Mm-hmm. You're constantly putting yourself out there. You, I'm sure mm-hmm. there was some kind of insecurity around what's everyone going to think. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, what? How did you kind of make sure you kind of kept your your mental health in a good state? Um, I mean. I'm I'm much better than I used to be at self care. Mm. Um, I when things were really intense around the show release, um, I was so busy, and I actually think my brain thrives when it's busy. Mm. It's when it's not busy that that the problems start. Yeah. Um, like I I was sort of on just on autopilot for like well basically for two years, but in the run up December January just like 
you know, emails flying out left, right and center, like phone calls, just like here, there and everywhere trying to sort stuff out. Um, my, that, my brain really likes having that stuff to do. Yeah. When the show came out, um, I suddenly felt really depressed. Um, and it felt like I'd had, I felt like I'd had a baby and that I couldn't love it. Like I, I didn't want to think about the show. Mm. Um, I didn't feel connected to it. It felt really distanced from me. I just felt this really weird sense of detachment from my own story, which went away. Um, but that was really interesting to me that like I had been fine. And then as soon as it came out, I just felt really like disgusted. (laughs) Um, and that's a fairly good example of how like my mental health just still like trips me up in unexpected ways. Um, you know, I, I still struggle. I still struggle. I still go through weeks, days or weeks where I don't feel right. Or, um, I feel incredibly anxious in a way that I feels intolerable. Obviously I know it's tolerable on a rational level, but I'm like, I don't want to feel like this anymore. Mm. Um, and the way I get through is the way I always get through. And that's just loving myself and, um, trying to get as much sleep as possible, trying not to drink too much, um, trying to make sure I see my friends, you know, all the, yeah. all the sensible things that I never did when I was in my twenties. Cause it was, it was all impossibly boring to me, but now I'm in my thirties. Um, a night in where I'm just looking after myself is actually a a dream. Um, and regular exercise and regular meditation, I I feel are the key, the the key game changers, but, um, you know, not, not solutions, you know, I don't know that there, there is a solution to the way my mind is might just be the way my mind is. (laughs) Yeah. Which is kind of a bleak thought, but maybe, uh, you know, I don't know. No, it's not a bleak thought. I'm, I'm, <laughs> it's not a bleak thought. I've made my peace with the way my mind is, but like, it's tiring, you know? <laughs> yeah, I can relate to that. Like when you said about being busy for me, like I'm always busy and, uh, and yeah. I don't say, say in a bad way. I think my brain just likes to be preoccupied with doing meaningful things to me, um, and then it's just finding that balance of when you really need to just sit in front of Netflix for four hours and binge it and not, yeah. you know. Well, actually, today's a good example. Can you still see me? Yeah. Um, <laughs> today's a good example because uh, I um, was at work. I'm quite lucky because I work for myself. So if I don't want to be in the office, I don't have to be. Um, and I just thought, I feel really overwhelmed. I need my own space. So I just took myself home at lunchtime um, and just spent some time with myself. And mm. that's what I needed to do. Because, I, you know, aside from OCD and anxiety, I'm just also a really deeply introverted character as well. Um, I was at the march. I was at the uh, Brexit march on Saturday in London. And, like, a crowd of, like, a million people is quite a stressful thing for yeah. me. <laughs> Uh, it sounds like a small minor thing, but like, I just, I, I felt like, uh, I just felt it was too much overstimulated and like felt knackered on Sunday and come Monday, I was like, just need to not be around people. Yeah. But it's cool. You know, it's, it's cool to be able to recognize those signs now. Cause I never used to, I used to sort of like bumble around like a daddy long legs, just like in constant chaos. And I'm not in that state anymore. And that's good. That's good. Yeah. You know yourself. And what makes you tick. do better at least yeah absolutely so there you said about kind of loving yourself and then you also said meditation and i believe last time we spoke you said you've been doing some loving kindness meditation mm-hmm. cool yeah yeah how's that kind of been working for you yeah really good um i'm like sold hook line and sinker on the on the benefits of this stuff um the challenge is making sure i keep it up yeah. and um like with any good habit I just need to make myself do it and uh, sort of make it become second nature um I still I was doing it every day for ages for like the best part of a year and then I started to slowly like slip off and then I was like okay well I sort of need to make it as easy 
for myself as possible to maintain the meditation practice. So I was like, oh, well, if I'm not doing 15 minutes a day, I'll do 10 minutes a day. Or even if I just do five minutes a day. Yeah. Um, just to try and just to try and keep that connection to the practice. But the loving kindness stuff is, um, yeah, has been a bit of a revelation, really. Um, I think we spoke about it last time, that there's just in the kind of CBT, CBT and exposure therapy you do for OCD, typically um, there's not a lot of love and it's quite aggressive um, and and it can be quite traumatic, actually. And I... I think it was really important in terms of like getting that behavioral work done and sort of extinguishing some of that anxiety. But, um, I think it can chip away at your self esteem as well. Mm. Um, and I now sort of my life's work is trying to get some of that back. And, um, I don't think there's any quick fix. I think learning to love yourself is a bit of a, a mission. But loving kindness is definitely like one proactive way of, of getting there quicker, I think. Yeah, no, absolutely. And as a plug for our previous episode, you talk a lot more about it on that. So people go check mm-hmm. that out after this episode. Yeah. Um, cool. So final question on the TV show then. Is there mm-hmm. any idea of when kind of the rest of the world will see it? <laughs> well, um <laughs> Uh, I don't know what sort of, again, TV, TVC, hmm. um, the, I really want it to go to America. I mean, I want it to go everywhere. Um, but obviously cause, um, I do work through my charity in America as well. Like it sort of feels a bit like a second home. So, yeah. um, and it's our sort of next biggest audience, I think. So, um, yeah, we, the next step is we're trying to get it in America and I, I hopefully you'll have some news on that pretty soon. Awesome. Um, yeah, that would be wicked. Yeah. All right, cool. And let me know when you, when you do and I can update this, uh, the show notes to this. Yeah, definitely. It will do. Cool. So, um, you may have answered this already, but since we last spoke, so what, six to eight months ago, um, <laughs> what have you learned about your own recovery journey? Ah, oh, what have I learned? Um, that it's non-linear. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm still. I, I was in a good place when we spoke last time, and I'm still in a good place. Um, but like, there was no, there's no sort of fixed line between those two points. Mm. Um, and I've had sort of extended periods since then where I felt fantastic also had quite a lot of lows um and i think for me a big part of recovery is acceptance um accepting present states accepting low states um and yeah being able to take time for yourself when when that happens and i think i sort of you know especially because i've spoken about my mind in public so much it's always like a little bit disappointing to me when I have when I used to have those struggles Mm. so I'm like man I really like I thought this wasn't me anymore um and but of course I like of course it is and you know I've said it a million times in public too that this is not something that I can banish um but yeah, I, 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 I think it's just the same same response as I had for you last time, that I just don't, I don't think that sort of recovery in inverted commas is possible, like total recovery. Like, I don't know, like, how can I cure a bit of myself? That's how I feel about it now. Mm. Um, I, that's not how I always felt. I used to think that uh, I used to sort of conceptualize it as an illness that, that I would one day find a cure to. But I'm I sort of uh, I'm not I'm not convinced by that idea anymore and you know like we were saying earlier like I don't know well what so when we had the event um that you came to uh, a few weeks ago the an evening conversation about mental health and I was speaking to Johnny Benjamin he's a friend of mine and an amazing mental health advocate with an incredible story and I asked him the question I said um would you know if if you could press the button and and turn off the bad stuff um, but it would take away all this amazing 
all these amazing life experiences you've had too, would you press it? And he said, without even pausing for breath, he was like, no way. <laughs> um, so that, and, and, and that's how I feel too. Mm. So um, just sort of being at peace with my lack of recovery, I think is, is the healthiest attitude I can take right now. Yeah. Yeah. Really good explanation. Um, cool. All right. So, uh, we've had Aaron Harvey on the show before and Mm -hmm. along with him, you've created made of millions.com. Um, yeah. For those that aren't familiar with made of millions, what it's all about and, uh, what will they see if they go there? Yeah. So, Made of Millions is a basically um, a grassroots mental health advocacy platform, um, and it's made by sufferers for sufferers. Um, you mentioned Aaron; he's he's my co-founder. Uh, I'm his co-founder, um, along with our team in New York. And both Aaron and I have had long-term mental health problems and and lived to tell the tale. And we wanted to use. Um, the model of being very ashamed, coming to terms with mental health problem and telling that story in public um, as an example of like the good stuff that can come from suffering and using our story as a way to empower others to explore their own mental health um, in any way that feels right for them. But um, we focus on art and photography and storytelling and writing. Mm. Um, so we host lots of different creators on the platform, people talking about their stories. Um, and it's also an extensive uh, research, uh, sort of resource for clinical information as well. So you'll see lots of articles on there by uh, people who are much more knowledgeable than us, um, talking about all sorts of different mental health conditions. Um, but we really try to take mental health out of a of a medical context and talk about it in the context of people's lives and their feelings and their emotions and their jobs and their relationships because that's what a lot of people are searching for when they go online yeah. um they they want to know you know they're like they want to know how um ocd is going to affect their marriage or they want to know how depression is going to affect their job um rather than just looking at a list of uh, you know, diagnostic criteria. So that's the, the uh, angle. Nice. Yeah, it's a really good point, and uh, it makes sense why people care about that because it is their life, and that's it's as you said, OCD can't be taken out of context. It's always mm-hmm. intertwined. Exactly. Yeah. 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 No, it's, it's a really good site as well, and I encourage uh, anyone to check it out. And you guys have put together a, a resource for um, uh, managers and employee, employers. Yeah, we've got, um, we sort of, so we're under the kind of Made of Millions umbrella, we've had sort of various different projects that we're working on. Um, one is um, different interviews with different advocates. So Aaron and I are on there. We have, we've hosted photographers like Ira Shinova and Yamna Alarashi. That's the art side of things. We also have the uh, workplace side of things. Um, it's, a really pressing issue right now. Um, there's a lot of pressure on employers to make sure that they're doing right by their employees, mm. to make sure that there are mental health facilities and that there's education in the workplace. And um, that means there's an opportunity for us to fill that gap. So Aaron and I are both from advertising and marketing backgrounds. Um, and um, we've worked to put together this resource base- basically as a guide to employers to, to how to make the office environment um, and people's jobs and livelihoods um, not a source of their mental health problems, but but rather a way that they can feel better about themselves. Um, and I think it's really, really important because, you know, if you've got a job that you hate and you're getting treated poorly, it's really hard to feel mentally healthy. Yeah. You know, it's so fundamental. It's something that we spend so much of our time doing. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's a real point of focus for us at the moment. So we're, we're talking to different big companies to get this guide sort of seeded down through all their employees, which would be amazing to put that in their hands. Mm. No, that is awesome. Um, and it's a great guide as well. So, uh, lastly then words of hope. So just Mm -hmm. people listening, just, um, whatever stage they're at, what kind of words of hope do you have for them? what kind of words of hope um i think 
uh, what I found so hopeful when I started learning about the brain and about OCD and about mental health is that the, when you're in the pits of mental despair, you kind of have this idea of it sort of being fixed and nothing can ever get better. Hmm. And, you know, people tell us on a conceptual level, you know, things can always get better. But that's quite intangible. It's difficult to grasp. Um, and when I started to learn about neuroplasticity, that really, like, brung that concept alive for me, the idea that the way we think can change our brains and that... Um, in all likelihood, my brain maybe looked a little bit different, not to the naked eye, but that I'd changed my neural pathways after having done exposure therapy than before. Mm. Um, and that if you're responding therapeutically to thoughts in the moment that you, even if you don't feel it, that you can be actively changing your mind quite literally. Um, I think that's quite a beautiful concept because yeah. it sort of, it sort of erodes this idea that, um, that, we're just this sort of like lump that that we're yoked with from birth and that and that it's always going to be like that but it's not necessarily um so yeah things can always get better but there's actually something behind that in terms of neuroscience i find that quite beautiful yeah i think that's a brilliant way to way to put it um yeah i like what you said there about um things will kind of get better but they may not you may not feel it instantly like it's mm -hmm. not sometimes if someone starts doing exposures or something why why aren't I feeling better straight away and it's yeah. holding that belief of even if I don't feel better right now I'm my brain is changing yeah and in time I'll see the kind of benefit of that yeah exactly yeah. cool no a great way to put it uh mm -hmm. cool so is there anything else I haven't asked you that you wish you could have shared um I think that's it really um yeah no i don't know do, have we covered everything yeah for, for this time i'll get you on again for this time yeah we'll, we'll do our little eight monthly check-in or whatever Sounds good. <laughs> so there you have it really hope you enjoyed my chat with rose and don't forget if you'd like to learn more about today's sponsor riley's wish including riley's story finding resources and to make a donation please visit rileyswish.com that's rileyswish.com and quick disclaimer, guys, this podcast is not therapy. It is not a replacement for therapy. Please seek treatment from a trained professional. Until we speak, take care.